Where there is war, there is profit. And Yemen, an already poor country that's been torn apart by five years of war, is no exception. But even before the war, Yemen was the poorest country in the Middle East, with half the population living below the poverty line, barely able to afford food and shelter. In order to survive, some Yemenis were forced to sell everything they had, even their organs. But this was no straightforward sale between two parties. There were surprising players involved who were, and might still be, making a huge profit. I was working on a farm when I went to Sana'a to see a friend. He asked me if I'd be willing to go to Cairo since I wasn't doing so well. So I said yes right away. Next thing I knew, they had made me a passport and I was going to Cairo. They said I'd be getting $5,000. So I went with it. $5,000. That's how much this donor got paid for his kidney when he sold it back in 2014. And even though the country wasn't yet in a full-scale civil war, that money could save lives. I donated a kidney. I was with my brother-in-law, and he told me we should do it. We were out of work, and we had families to support. So we reached out to a broker, and he reached out to them. And Yemeni brokers could do a good job of selling the procedure because most of them started out as donors. I started off as a donor. I was in jail for owing people money when I met a gang that gave me the number of a broker who I contacted when I got out. He asked for my passport number, and three days later, he told me to go to pick up my ticket from the Egypt Air Office and travel. Our broker wasn't a match to any of the ring's clients, so he was asked to be a middleman instead. According to him, most successful donors would go back to Yemen to enlist more donors, making a commission on every person they recruit. And they were able to enlist a lot of donors because they could sell the procedure as profitable, discreet, and harmless, thanks to the faint scars the surgery leaves. A laparoscopic resection is done and leaves no visible marks. Just because the surgery is simple doesn't mean the danger was over once it was done. Normally, an organ donor is monitored by the hospital for a month after surgery. But these donors were sent back to Yemen as soon as possible. They didn't give me time to recover. I lost everything, and I'm still facing complications to this day. I'm grateful to God for being here, but I can't carry anything that might be too heavy. These kinds of post-operative complications made them unable to do the labor-intensive work they relied on to feed their families and left them even less capable of providing than they were before the surgery. The donors didn't know about these after effects, and the brokers, in trying to make a commission, weren't likely to tell them. With our limited means, we verified a thousand cases, but there are over 10,000 cases. Of the thousand we interviewed, 900 had sold their kidneys and come back to Yemen as brokers looking to find new victims. While the network spread in Yemen, its home base was Egypt. It's become the hub of organ trafficking in the Middle East, one of five major centers in the world. It's a highly profitable industry believed to make between $840 million and $1.7 billion a year worldwide. Here, crooked doctors, brokers, hospitals, and embassy officials would coordinate to make potential millions off the misery of people while paying them a lot less. We managed to find an Egyptian broker in this network to tell us about how he got started. I started this work around four years ago. I did it because my younger brother was sick. And after running some tests, we found out he had problems with his kidneys and he'd have to have a transplant. So a broker put us in touch with someone Yemeni who told me he could donate his kidney. After the operation, he went back home and we stayed in touch. 
We kept talking and he started telling me he could find others willing to donate if I knew of anyone who needed transplants. So that's how it started. Yemenis weren't the only victims of the organ trade in Egypt. Vulnerable migrants and refugees from across Africa and the Middle East were and still are coaxed into selling their organs or have them harvested against their will. But recruitment was a lot easier in Yemen because the country has no laws against organ trafficking. We worked with the security apparatus and specifically the Ministry of Interior and informed them of 87 brokers. They were caught, then arrested and taken to court, but they were all released. It seems to have started in 2008 and 2009. I was a police officer with criminal investigations before I worked here. We received some information about people who were going to leave the country for suspicious reasons. And soon after, we caught a man trying to leave Sana for Cairo. During our interrogation, we found out some shocking information. It became clear that more than 50 or 60 other people were somehow involved with this guy. Some of them to leave days later, others who'd already sold their kidney. Nabil left his job with the police to found his anti-trafficking organization soon after. Through years of collecting testimonies and evidence, he began to connect the dots between the organ trafficking incidents. Here's what we learned about how the system works. So we told him that we don't have passports, but he told us not to worry about it, that he'd sort it out. So we waited the week while he arranged our passports and spoke to his guy in Egypt. Then he said we we're ready to go, they bought us tickets, and we went. They take your money, they take your phone, they keep whatever you have, even your passport. The apartment was full of people there to sell. They took our passport as soon as we got there and walked us out like sheep. One at a time, two at a time, every day for two days, three days, only going to the clinic to get tested until they find a match. They have your passport so you can't leave. And how could we when we don't have any money? You would think the hospitals would have raised the alarm about these Yemeni donors when they came in to have tests done. However, according to the brokers we spoke to, these hospitals turned a blind eye because they were making a profit too. We work with public and private hospitals. In Egypt, unlike Yemen, it's illegal to sell your organs. What is legal is Egypt's growing state-sanctioned medical tourism industry that brings large numbers of foreign patients and money to its hospitals. In order to protect the image of this lucrative industry and the country it's in, the government of Egypt passed laws to fight organ trafficking. For example, before undergoing transplant surgery, a donor must testify that they are donating out of goodwill and not for money, either in writing or on camera. The donors, of course, say what they need to say. They were videotaping me. They asked me if I had come to donate. I said, yes, I came to donate. You know, as they told me. They had already told me it was important that no responsibility would fall back on the hospital, so I said it wouldn't. Several hospitals across Egypt have been accused of hosting these donors, and the government has busted prominent doctors and institutions working in trafficking rings over the past few years. But in Nabil's records from 2014, one hospital in particular kept coming up. One that saw no arrests, despite Nabil's letters to notify anti-trafficking organizations in Cairo. The Intelligence Hospital, Wadi Nil Hospital. According to our sources in Egypt, the hospital belongs to the Egyptian general security apparatus and is commonly known as the Mukhabarat or intelligence hospital. The Mukhabarat hospital is typically used for Yemeni donors, and the receiving patients are usually Saudis and other foreigners. We approached the hospital for an interview, but hospital security claimed an interview would breach their protocols. So we called and spoke to someone claiming to be a manager at the hospital. 
no such thing is happening here. There's an organ transplantation law in Egypt that says that if the patient is Yemeni, then the donor must be Yemeni with a passport accredited by the embassy and the embassy's approval to donate. This law has been in place for years. Anything but that is nonsense. He's referring to an Egyptian law that restricts organ transplants to a donor and recipient of the same nationality. And yet, all three donors in this film say they had their surgeries done at Wadi Nil Hospital and that the recipients of their kidneys were foreign nationals. They found a woman from the UAE who needed a kidney. So we did the blood and tissue tests and found that we were a match. So I went in for the surgery. Afterwards, she asked me how much I got. I said $5,000. She told me that she had paid $50,000. Most of the patients that come for transplants are from the GCC. But there are also Italians, Israelis, and Egyptians. Besides having to be of the same nationality, the donor and recipient must be related, according to the Yemeni embassy. It's the Yemeni embassy's job to check if they're related or not, to give the donor approval to donate. So if the donor agrees and the recipient agrees, do you still think people are being forced? Proof of relation is signed off on by the Yemeni ministries of foreign affairs and justice. But it's the embassy that receives this paperwork and coordinates with the Egyptian Ministry of Health to finalize the approval for a transplant. And according to our broker, they were quite lenient. The embassy announced that it was illegal to donate an organ unless it was to a relative, and that their relation would have to be approved by the embassy. We had 15 or 20 people waiting to donate, but this stopped them. So the network sent me to Yemen to get the necessary paperwork to prove relation. I made a deal with the judge to pay him 80,000 Yemeni rials per case and he'd get it signed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I had done three when they told me to stop because they'd found someone at the embassy who could approve the request for $500 each. To be honest, our work would be impossible without the cooperation of government entities in Yemen that make bringing Yemenis over to Egypt much easier for us. This wasn't the only accusation against the embassy. We proved the involvement of the Yemeni embassy in Cairo. There were laws in Egypt being broken, and our embassy could have acted, but they just denied it. When we presented the embassy with our evidence, they acted like they would do what was necessary, but they didn't. The embassy is still involved to this day, because this business makes them a lot of money. After many attempts to reach the embassy, we finally got a response. Regarding organ trafficking, the only thing the embassy does is address medical authorities, and only after the documents required by the Egyptian Ministry of Health and the Egyptian courts have been completed. Documents that prove kinship come through a court ruling from the Yemeni Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Yemeni Ministry of Justice, and a document showing the approval of the transplant procedure comes from the Egyptian Ministry of Health. The patient and the donor come to us with all these papers, and all we need to do is take all this information to the Egyptian medical authorities. While the embassy denies any accountability for what happened years ago, more and more Yemenis stuck in Egypt because of the war are now resorting to selling their organs to make ends meet. There aren't as many cases now that Sana airport is closed and Egypt has stopped allowing Yemeni citizens to enter the country. And with the airport closed, Yemenis who went to Egypt when the war broke out are now stuck there and have been forced to sell their kidneys out of desperation. We've recorded more than 200 such cases. But given the state Yemen is in today, it's unlikely that any significant policy changes will be made. In Yemen, resistance to the organ trafficking trade remains civil and voluntary. But even then, such organizations face challenges. We volunteer to do this work without any state support, and yet still we face threats and a lot of pressure. This is probably going to be my last interview, because we're living in a country where even humanitarian work is prohibited, or only allowed for certain people. After we filmed with Nabil, his organization was shut down by Houthi forces. They had published a report alleging Houthi involvement in organ trafficking. Nabil was forced to leave Yemen. There's no way we can actually work to stop this when we're in the middle of war 
and destruction and poverty, and people can barely afford food. What policies are we supposed to push for in a situation like this? There's no solution except to stop the war. Rebuild the country, that's the only solution, and it's just not possible.